start with some brief Mangala Chara. Gurave Gauda Chandraya Radhikaya Tadalaya Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tad Bhaktaya Namo Namaha <clears throat> So, good morning to all of you, Pranam, and welcome. Greetings from Alachua, almost living here back to North Carolina. And welcome to our bi-weekly series of lectures, Tadatmya lectures, as part of our Tadatmya Sangha Devotional Alliance. Uh, some of the offerings we would like to offer to the community, the world, each of us, in terms of sharing topics that we consider relevant and hopefully relatable to our daily experiences practitioners as humans, as living entities inhabiting this particular time and place in the context of serving Sri Krishna, the sweet absolute, one for another. So today we'll be sharing a brief presentation on the topic of evolution and Vedanta. The subtitle is Exploring the Eternal Unfolding of God, Humanity, Love, and matter. So these four, God, us, as souls, basically, in human experience, love, and matter. So this presentation is somehow a preview of, of my next book that I'm writing, almost finishing, uh, which is on this topic. And I plan to give today a brief, so to say, trailer of that. But we are planning also to do a fourth a one month series, which is one class per week, probably next month. So I will be expanding on that in further detail. Today will be a little bit of a, again, preview trailer of a more expanded presentation on this topic. <clears throat> so in brief, just to make this clear and put the whole discussion in, in context, the main theme when I'm talking here in terms of evolution and Vedanta in connection to love, God, the soul, and material energy, and I will try to present that today, is how, is, how everything in reality basically is ever-evolving. How everything, starting with love as the ultimate supreme reality, continuing with God, surrendered to that love, affected by that love with us, taking shelter in love and God, and matter in connection to all of them, how all of this uh, realities, if you want to put it like that, or, or aspects of reality. All of them are in constant progress, growth, development, evolution. How low, How all of them are processes, if you will, instead of fixed, changeless substances, hmm, which are always the same. Hmm. So I, I will try to, hopefully, to, to establish clearly this shift that sometimes we may need to do from seeing reality as a fixed thing, predictable, controllable, always the same, and so on and so forth. Instead, the idea is to present the notion of reality, God, love, us, matter, as an ongoing process mm -hmm. of unfolding, which, at least in my opinion, keeps things way more exciting, <laughs> way more alive, way more dynamic. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the, the example is given like a spiral. Well, that's something that moves in circles, but never never in the same way, in the same point, but ever-expanding mm -hmm. circularity, so to say. So I like to call this, at least in my book, I refer to this as deep evolution. Mm -hmm. Evolution happening in the depths of reality, in the depths of everything, starting, as we will see, with divine love, continuing with the divine himself, ourselves, and so on. Mm -hmm. So that's the main intention of this presentation I'm trying to describe portray how the totality of existence uh, remains in a perpetual state of growth and expansion mm -hmm. deep evolution that's how i like to refer to mm -hmm. evolution experienced in a sacred mat manner in a sacred way deep evolution mm -hmm. so Bearing this in mind, at least in my opinion, a mere recognition of evolution falls short, but we need a new consciousness of being in evolution. 
we follow. If we understand in theory that reality keeps expanding, growing, evolving, unfolding, we need to embrace a corresponding consciousness to relate to that. To understand the ever-evolvingness of everything, we need to be ever-evolving ourselves. We need to put on, so to say, those lenses. Mm -hmm. Somehow I mentioned this in my last book, Radical Personalism. I touch upon this topic here and there. Generally, that's what happens with my books. I kind of speak about something and at the end I feel, okay, I didn't speak about this enough. So I need to write the whole book about this. This is the topic deserves a separate volume. <laughs> So in Radical Personalism, I uh, I mentioned this. So somehow this series and this new book I'm writing is an extension of the previous one. Uh, I share with you a brief quote that I mentioned there in connection to today's topic, which says like this. We are to keep pace with an ever-evolving reality that we are part of, with an ever-evolving God we are tied to, and thereby with an ever-evolving tradition through which these very principles are revealed to us. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there I use the word ever-evolving three times to make the case that reality is ever-evolving, God is ever-evolving, and therefore a sampradaya or a school of thought like the one we belong is also ever-evolving since it attempts to grasp this ever-evolving principle. So we must be ever-evolving to connect with all that. We must keep ourselves in that spirit, in that willingness to move, to grow, to expand, uh, to acknowledge that there is unlimited potential waiting for everything, for all of us. I'm part of the... <clears throat> As I was talking to back to Russ a few minutes ago, my intention with all this presentation is not just to give like a lofty philosophical presentation, like, okay, let's get it right sedantically, philosophically. It's not limited to that, but it's also in a practical way, apply, apply it all, how to apply all this in our daily life. And so part of my intention is that, I mean, to, to realize how reality uh, <clears throat> has a potential, has a bright trajectory. So we shouldn't be judging things for what they are so far for us till today or what they have been in the past. Generally, we have the tendency many times. We, we make assumptions on the basis of our past experiences. You bring, you bring me a glass of water. I already have figured out what a glass of water is according to my previous experience of what is a glass, of what is water, what I'm supposed to do with that. And somehow I bring closure to the glass of water instead of keeping that reality called the glass of water open to ever-evolving patterns, so to say. I'm just using a glass of water as an example. You can apply that to things and people and situations and God himself. So the intention of this is to keep us in a state of disclosure, of openness, childlike, so we can always grasp the awe and wonder that should be fueling our practice and our life in a healthy way. Rasasar Chamatkar, the essence of the loving experience is astonishment. And as we were talking these days, this awe and wonder is a prerequisite for proper surrender. We should surrender only after having experienced awe and wonder. So realizing how rea reality is ever evolving naturally evokes this sense of awe and wonder, which in turn fuels a healthy surrender, a healthy approach to reality itself. Again, to see things according to their potential, according to all that they can be, instead of what they were in the past or even what they are in the future. It's a way more generous uh, prospect, including us ourselves, not only judging ourselves for who we are so far, but which is our brightest potential and relating to everyone and everything else in those same terms. So I think if we properly integrate this vision and this important point that can affect the way we live our lives, we experience life, we experience spiritual practice, we relate to each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, how we can remain in this students forever spirit, in a state of awe and wonder, this ideal prerequisite for surrender, mm -hmm. realizing the ever-evolvingness of everything. Mm -hmm. 
So that, that's the spirit of the presentation and that's the spirit, again, of reality and that's the spirit of Parampara, as I quoted in Radical Personalism, a tradition who tries to speak about an ever-evolving reality must be ever-evolving as well. I, I found some interesting words recently from Srila Prabhupada that I'd like to quote, share with you. He says like this in this connection, how this dynamic spirit must be the landmark of a Parampara. So Prabhupada says, if one's previous teachers have written something, one will not touch those points, but write something which can develop further. In, if one at all writes, that person will write something which will beautify or glorify or magnify the former idea. Mm -hmm. So the spirit is always to magnify, to expand, acknowledging there is a possibility for that. Mm -hmm. Similar to Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur's words in his famous Bhagavad speech, when he says that student is to read the facts with a view to create, not with the object of fruitless retention. Students, like satellites, should reflect whatever light they receive from authors and not imprison facts and thoughts. Thought is progressive. The author's thought must, must have progress in the reader in the shape of correction or development, and so on, many other things he mentioned. So this is spirit of belonging to a tradition, spiritual tradition, mystical school, like the one most of us belong, the Gaudiya Sampradaya, one of constant expansion and unfolding of this bottomless revelation, and acknowledging there's always place for more, because that's the nature of reality, ever-evolving. In mystical Christianity, this spirit has been beautifully encapsulated by Jesus himself when he declares to his disciples that you will not only carry on the work I initiated, but you will surpass it. So that's very interesting. The master telling his students, you will not only represent me, but you will augment what I've given to you. That's, that's the nature of the subject matter we are dealing with. He gives this example of the wine skin. If you pour New wine skin into new wine into all white skin, wine skin. The wine will not survive that, so to say. You knew new wine skin. You knew newer vessels, further evolved presentations. Not only adjusting the language to the times, but developing the content, the inner substance. Mm -hmm. Because again, the content even of sacred scriptures, the content of revelation is endless. Mm -hmm. Even one single book, like Tritanya Charitamrita in our tradition, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhattam, what they say is endless. And, and that's why we can also continue writing other books, reflecting on that, and it's endless. Mm -hmm. For example, Chaitanya Charitamrita, the hagiography, main hagiography of Sri Chaitanya, the Mahaprabhu, describes itself, the book describes itself as ever fresh. Mm -hmm. So that's a, another way of saying ever evolving. And it's urging the readers to revisit the book again and again. Again, not like mere mechanical repetition, but making this point, something is ever fresh. Something new is always coming. It remains in a state of development. Mm -hmm. Or similar in, in, similarly in the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Bhagavatam is portrayed, the content of the Bhagavatam is portrayed as palatable and relishable at every step, mm -hmm. or also newer at every moment. So it's self-renovating. There is a self-renewal in, in, in the nature of spiritual reality. It remains in a constant state of update and actualization. Similar with the Bhagavad Gita, just touching upon the three main texts in our tradition, if you will. So in the Bhagavad Gita, one of the final verses, there is Sanjaya. He's expressing being thrilled at every moment by recalling this sacred conversation again and again. So he makes the same point at the very closure of the Gita. At every moment I'm thrilled. It's not a just now and not after or before. At every moment, and I'm recalling this again and again and never is, becomes stale. Again, it's ever fresh. Wisdom is ever evolving. Let's put it like that. So since wisdom is ever evolving, it requires an ever evolving approach. We are to approach ever evolving wisdom in an ever-evolving way. That's what we call parampara. Technically speaking, parampara means this dynamic, 
ever-evolving approach to reality, ever-evolving reality. So reality in itself is ever-evolving, not only is sacred scripture. So since all of reality is ever-evolving, as hopefully we will see now, that requires an ever-evolving approach at every moment. How to approach reality, ever-evolving reality at every moment? In an ever-evolving way, we call that bhakti. That's abhideya, the means, how, how we address reality. Now, reality is ever-evolving. To address the ever-evolving reality in an ever-evolving manner, we call that bhakti. Because as we will see now, bhakti is ever-evolving. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the approach that matches the nature of reality. If I am approaching ever-evolving reality, I must do so with an ever-evolving approach, method. Mm -hmm. So now we will start mentioning these four main points of the lecture love, God, the soul, and matter, briefly, and how each of them is ever evolving, beginning with love or bhakti. That's another way of saying. So in my book, I'm also dividing it in that way, four chapters uh, concerning first love, then God, then the soul, then material energy. Somehow these are four hierarchical <laughs> sections, so to say. First, there is love. Then there is God, since the goal of life is love, not God. <laughs> And the goal of life is love for us and for God as well. It's ever evolving, as we will see. We can always attain more love. So first, there is love personified in Sri Radha, if you will, who is Krishna's guru, Radhikar Prima Guru, I mean Then comes God, then we come, and then material energy. But all of them, in their own way, we will see they are ever evolving. So I'll briefly touch upon them today. I don't have time to go in detail with each one of these four, but in our four class presentation next month, we'll delve into each of them in further detail, dedicating one separate class for each one of these four. So that's it. So far, I gave this brief introduction to the topic and to the nature of reality <clears throat> as ever evolving. Now I will go to flesh out in this reality as ever evolving in these four category, categories. Mm -hmm that we will call in our tradition Shakti Mam and Shakti, the energetic source, God, and Shakti, the potencies, which are Swarup Shakti, Tatasta Shakti, and Maya Shakti. Another way to say that is love, the soul, and matter. So if we want to be reductionistic, the whole of reality is reduced to these four items. No? God is the energetic source, and these three energies, love, soul, and matter. So these are the four categories I'm describing now. So let's begin with love, again, the highest, the ultimate reality, love, and how love is ever-evolving. Of course, first, we may need to define love. What's love? <laughs> so let's define love as a profoundly intentional act that tries to promote the best for the person we love at every moment. Because we can talk about love, everyone talks about love, but most of us do not have a very clear idea what's love. Mm -hmm. So a profoundly intentional act, I'm investing my will there, which is aimed at promoting mm -hmm. the best for the person we love. In a general way, we are defining that. Mm -hmm. And of course, this concept extends beyond God, that it's so unique recipient and embrace everyone and everything else in connection to God. Of course, God is the perfect object of love. That's how Rupa Goswami defines it. But everything else exists in connection to God. So if we want to, if we love God, we are supposed to love the things God loves as well. And that happens to be everything. So everything is to be loved in this way. Rupa Goswami says, Anyavila Sita Sunyang Jnana Karmadi Navrita, Anukoliana Krishnana Silanam Bhaktarutam. It's similar. How love uh, expresses itself. Krishna, God is the perfect object and is an intentional, voluntary act to bring pleasure to the object of our affection without ulterior motives and so on and so forth. So that's love. Love is defined in this way, but love manifests and expresses in different ways. Mm -hmm. Because if we are relating with a saint, with a criminal, with God himself, it may take different shapes. All of the principle, the underlying principle of love is the same. Mm -hmm. The essence of love remains uniform, let's say, 
and the expressions of love are pluriform, you know, express themselves in multiple ways. Mm -hmm. And despite this, beyond this, true love, as we will see, is inherently dynamic and ever evolving. Mm -hmm. True love can only become more of what it is. True love has no opposite. You follow? When you really ad ad embrace, experience true love, there's not something that can be opposed to that. It can only become more of what already is. That's the nature of true love. Mm -hmm. So this love, again, is ever-evolving. It means it's on the move. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing process of expansion. Love moves like a serpent, Rupa Goswami will say. So love moves like a serpent. Serpent first implies, okay, like a serpent is unpredictable, but it moves. Now, it's moving. Love, it's moving. Love, it's ever evolving. It's it's flowing. It's like a fluid. In fact, in Sanskrit, we have the term rasa. Sometimes it's translated as juice. Different, difficult to translate these terms. We have the rasa lila, the rasa mandala, you know, the highest lila of all, the, the dance, the rasa dance between Krishna and the gopis. And rasa, again, mandala means circles, so or a circle of this flowing juice, which is love in constant movement. Rasa means essential flow. Let's translate it as that for our purposes. Rasa is the most fundamental of all flows. That's what love is. Rasa is another word for the ultimate phase of love, the most fundamental of all flows. So that speaks about love's constant, relentless, expansion. Hmm? When we go, <clears throat> for example, to a definition of bhakti, which we are using here as a synonym for love, Narada Bhakti Sutra, which is one of the main texts, one of the main bhakti texts on bhakti, of course, uh, it defines bhakti as the subtlest consciousness, the more subtle consciousness, free from material qualities. And then it says it's never interrupted and it's increasing at every moment. So that's the very definition of bhakti, something, among other things, which is not interrupted, which is, again, is on the move, progressing and increasing at every moment. Mm -hmm. This is similar to the definition that Srimad Bhagavatam gives in 1st Canto, 2nd chapter, verse 6. Bhakti is free from separate agenda, from ulterior motives, and apratihata. This is the important word here. Apratihata means uncontainable, so to say. Uninterrupted, unbroken, relentless, if you will. So that's the nature of bhakti, interestingly, as depicted in, in our tradition. Bhakti can only become more bhakti. Bhaktiya. Sanjataya Bhaktiya says the Bhagavad. And I'm providing some quotes from scriptures just for you to know that what I what we are sharing today is always scripturally supported. Bhaktiya Sanjataya Bhaktiya. This means coming to think. Bhakti comes from bhakti. And bhakti takes to further bhakti. Love can only take us to a further, deeper, broader expression of that same love. So in that sense, love becomes the unceasing goal. <laughs> no. love takes us to go to love love takes us to love to further further sadhana and sadhya love is the bhakti is the means bhakti is the goal hmm? why because love is ever evolving so it can always remain the goal there it can always be something to be yet attained on a new further level hmm? as i say love is the goal of life for us <clears throat> prayogen prem prayogen we call it and God is the love is the goal of life for God Himself. Krishna has love, of course, He's made of that, but the nature of love is such that it can always attain newer heights. So there's always a new expression of love to taste, to relish, to experience. In that sense, love is the goal of life for God and for us. So love is the universal goal of life. And therefore, it's the, it's the highest reality for everyone, including God. That's why I'm talking about love first here. So bhakti is its own reward, so to say. Love is its own reward. Like Krishna says to the gopis, 
in the Bhagavad Gita, in the Bhagavatam, Pareham Nirabhadya Sanjaya. Let your love be your own reward. I cannot repay back to that. The only way to repay to love is with further love. That's the nature of love. Mahaprabhu says that in Sikshastakam. Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam Pratipadam Purnam Brita Sradhanam Anandam Bhuti Vardhanam is an ocean that is constantly ex expanding and increasing. That's the nature of this. Pratipadam Purnam Brita Sradhanam At every step one is tasting and relishing. <laughs> Purnam Brita, the totality of deathless nectar. At every step more and more in increasing ways. <clears throat> Sorry if I'm overwhelming you with all this incredible perspective. I hope you have fastened your seatbelt before we started the lecture. I didn't I didn't mention that. Sorry for that. <laughs> so this is so because love can remain in expansion because love is not only a potency, a shakti, but also a potency. Being a potency has potential. So it's important that we keep the two things together. Whenever we talk about potency, we are speaking about the potential. Every potency has potential. Mm -hmm. and, and love is not an exception to this rule. Actually, love is the rule. Love is the main potency, the main shakti, the most potent one, and the one which more potential. So the more love one possess, the more we can hint at how much more love is possible. That's the potential. If I love, if I really love, that will only give me a glimpse of how much love there can be experienced and given and, and, and so on and so forth. And this is an interesting point because that's why in the scripture to say the more we love, the more humble we become. Sanatan Goswami says that in Brihad Bhagavatam Brita, the more prem, the more dainya. The more humility, the more love, the more love, the more humility, the two of them act as cause and effect of each other. Why? Because, again, I'm being humbled by the endless prospect how much more love I can give and offer. I'm loving, but I can never become proud of that. Once we attain divine love, for example, nobody will think, okay, now I have prem, divine love, so I can rest and I can become arrogant because of my attainment. No, because having love gives you a glimpse of how much more love you can have. You, you, you are faced with an infinite ocean of possibilities and that's humbling. So the more love you have, the more humble you, you, you necessarily have to become. The more we come in connection, <clears throat> in the words of Srila Siddhar Maharaj, the more we come in connection with the infinite <clears throat> through the principle of love, the more we will <clears throat> the more we will realize there is no limit to how much progress I can make. <clears throat> and that's humbling. And that's why great personalities who experience love, they feel, I have no love, paradoxically, because they realize how much more love can be had. So in comparison to what they already have, subjectively, they feel, I have no love. Mahaprabhu, who is the ultimate expression of love, he will say, Na prima gandhasti darapi harome. In me, there is not even the scent, the aroma of prem, of love. And, and if he didn't have Prem, nobody has it. <laughs> but he will say, I have no love. Because he had so much love that he could glimpse how much more love could be had. So he will conclude, I have no love. Mm -hmm. So that's a very interesting, paradoxical, humbling experience. Mm -hmm. Again, because more love can be attained and offered. So that creates its own necessity. We can also talk about love. <clears throat> In terms of being the ultimate necessity, prem prayojan. Prayojan means attainment, but prayojan also means necessity. Mm -hmm. So love means the ultimate necessity. One will say, okay, once you attain love, you don't need anything else. That's the ultimate necessity. But also we can understand prem prayojan saying that love not only is the ultimate necessity, but love creates the ultimate necessity in the form of further love. <laughs> Again, love is ever evolving. So you have love and you now have needs that come out of love. Generally, we have needs because we lack love. <laughs> we have so this and then endless list of needs. But when we have love, you enter into another category of necessities, sacred ones. So you become needy 
in a loving, transcendental way due to the ever-evolving nature of love. You can always have more, experience more, give more. <clears throat> and that keeps us in a in an eternal state of divine dissatisfaction, if you want to go there like that. Don't get scared by that. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's ongoing. That makes that allows the whole thing to continue going on for eternity without getting bored of that. You can always update your experience of love. That's an interesting section in Brihad Bhagavatamrita, uh, where uh, who is uh, Narad Muni is requesting Krishna, please, a unique blessing from Krishna. He says, to, he asks Krishna, may no one ever feel they have enough love for, they never have enough of your love. May no one, he has that blessing. Give me a blessing, Krishna. Krishna say, what's that blessing? May no one ever feel they have enough of your love. <laughs> That's an interesting blessing to request. And Krishna says, that's that's nonsense, Narada, because that's all already happening. Pay attention to those who have love. They are never satisfied. They always look for more because they can always experience more love. That's what makes God from Atmaram of self-satisfied to Pararam or divinely dissatisfied. Because Atmaram means I'm satisfied, I have everything. But when love enters into the stage, you can always relish that more and more and more. So on top of God being self-satisfied, he's divinely dissatisfied because he's affected by the necessities that come out of ever-evolving love. Mm -hmm. So that's the nature of love. Rupa Goswami, a few more words before turning to the next section. Since love, I, I will spend more time with love since it's the foundational reality of all the other ones. In Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, <clears throat> Rupa Goswami, similarly, when he speaks about Prem, divine love, he characterizes it as ever fresh, constantly self-renewal. Uh, and in his sequel, Ujbal Nilamani, Rupa Goswami makes the same point. He elaborates on love saying, love is never diminishing, which is another way of saying always expanding, never diminishing, even though there may be reasons for it to diminish. Mm -hmm. There may be obstacles that get in the way of one's loving experience, but the nature of love is that it, it will conquer all those obstacles, feed, nourish from them, so to say, because it's all powerful and continue moving forward in an ever expanded version. Mm -hmm. And if all these statements that I've shared so far are still insufficient, I'll share a few more just in case. <laughs> Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's dissertation of love, Prem Samput, beautiful book. He there he boldly asserts that if someone dares to proclaim this defines the limits of love, then such a person, he says, knows nothing about love. Even if he has immersed himself in the study of all sacred texts, if someone dares to proclaim this and this and this defines the limits of love, putting love in a, in a box and limit it, that means exactly the opposite. That means that you have no clue what love is because the nature of love is ever expanding. It's on the move. It always creates an, an expression that of eternal newness. Mm -hmm. An interesting facet of love that relates to that is the, is the expression called anurag. Anurag is described by Rupa Goswami, especially his Ujbal Nilavani. And Anurag is this unique facet of love where you meet your beloved, like Radha and Krishna in transcendence. They meet with one another, and after their meeting, they got separated from by the force of circumstance in the Lila. And they see them again, let's say after 20 seconds, <laughs> and they experience seeing each other for the first time. Although they were together a few seconds before and they were together so many other times eternally, unlimitedly. But the nature is that love is always new, so it always makes us see the object of our love as always new. That's very interesting. You know? Sri Radha is separated from Krishna. She said, tells Lalita after a few seconds, who is that blue sapphire cloud-like boy that I'm so enchanted? And Lalita said, that's Krishna. You have been with him a few seconds ago. She says, no, no, this is someone else, someone new. Who is that person? No. Krishna appears ever new because of the ever new nature of love. So anurag means this. It's very interesting. Anurag, let's put it like, means 
falling in love all the time. <laughs> Sometimes we think that falling in love happened once, right? At the beginning, honeymoon period, and then that's it's over. Then we have to land into reality, so to say. I take responsibility and tolerate our partner. <laughs> but in, in, in the dynamics of real love, it's ever evolving. So you have the potential to fall in love all the time. Hmm. Unique. And who is the personification of this love, ever evolving love? Sri Radha, Sri Mati Radharani in our tradition. She's love incarnate, so to say. Or, or if you will, she's God's own heart, assuming a form, assuming a distinctive identity, again engaging in Leela, divine love in exchange with Krishna perpetually. She's the goddess. She's the supreme personality of God. She's the supreme personality of the goddess. And loving Krishna, playing with Krishna, Leela, and dancing. Now in this dance, Radha and Krishna embodying, embody God falling in love with God. In one sense, both Radha and Krishna are inseparable. In the words of Vishwana, they are one soul in two bodies. So it's God appearing in these two forms, and one falling in love with it, God falling in love with God in ever fresh ways, without any tinge of narcissism. <laughs> when referring to Radha and her love, Krishna says in the in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, as I said, Radhikar Prima Guru, I'm mean, The love of Sri Radha is my teacher, my guru, and I am a Sisya, and I am pupil. I am her puppet, basically, dancing. Her ever-evolving love constantly makes me dance in extraordinary ways. Krishna, God is saying that. The nature of love is such that God himself becomes a student of love and dances in, in his, her hands eternally. Newer and newer dances because of the nature of love. So, so love is this unique, greatest, the ultimate mystery. No? Love is the greatest mystery. Love is the greatest, the ultimate paradox, if you will. And, and therefore, the love of Sri Radha constitutes the zenith of that. Mm -hmm. This is described in Chaitanya Charitamrita very uniquely. One for Adilila, chapter 4, verse 128. For those who would like to have the reference, says that the love of Sri Radha is all-pervading, Mm -hmm. leaving no room for expansion, yet increasing at every second. That's paradoxical. That's love. Paradox holds the most truth. So this love increases at every second. Mm -hmm. It's unconditional, in other words. No matter the conditions, it can only increase. Mm -hmm. The love of Sri Rad is nicely de depicted in the last verse of Sikshastakam, Aslisya Bapada Ratam Pinashtama, etc., there, her uncondition, the unconditionality of her love is beautifully depicted. Despite obstacles, despite challenges, this love can only increase. It's unconditional. That's the meaning of un one of the meanings of unconditional. Sometimes when we hear unconditional love, that's a favorite topic of mine. Krishna loves you unconditionally. So we hear the notion of unconditional love and may think, okay, we are receiving something beyond deserving. That's unconditional love. And that's that's great. It's it, That's true. That's legal. <laughs> but also it's important, crucial to recognize that also unconditional love points to a love that is free from all conditions and limitations in the sense that it's perpetually expanding. And Sri Radha personifies that. And Krishna is impacted by Radha's love. Krishna is profoundly affected by love. So how does love impact God? How does this ever-evolving love impact God and make him ever-evolving? Hmm? So now we'll turn to the next section of our presentation. After talking about how love is ever-evolving, let's now see how God is ever-evolving. God in love is ever-evolving. That's the God we worship. We worship a God in love, right? <laughs> so, of course, some may say, but Maharaj, this section is, in one sense, redundant. And, and I agree in one point. Why? Because we could say the nature of love is ever fresh. We have already established that. Uh, every mystical tradition at the same time, including ours, says that God not only has love, but God is love. He's made of love. We will say the same thing. Raso Vaisyaha, 
his rasa ananda maya biasat, he's made of ananda, which is related to love. So my point is, if God is love, and love is ever-evolving, then God is ever-evolving. There's no need to explain this separately. Follow my point? No. God is made of love. I know it's a difficult idea, and it goes way beyond our head. We never probably met anyone made of love. <laughs> so, But if you are made of love, you cannot not love. That's one of the divine limitations of God. He cannot not love, because love is his exclusive nature. He cannot but love hmm. so god is love and we already show love is ever evolving and god is made of that ever evolving love therefore god is ever evolving hmm. so we could skip this section basically and we can if you have something to do the next few minutes you can go and do it <laughs> but nonetheless i'll try to say something about this briefly and that's why i use more time to explain how love is ever evolving because that's in one sense explains everything else. But I will say some words. Why? Especially because sometimes many of us, some of us, at least unconsciously, have a wrong idea about God. A wrong idea in connection to, to this topic of ever-evolvingness. And this root misunderstanding of God takes us to misread everything else. Because God is the source of everything. So if you misread the source of everything, probably you misread everything else that comes from that source. Mm -hmm. And what's the, the misreading of God, the misunderstanding about God in connection to this topic of ever evolvingness? To think that God is immutable, only immutable in nature, that God is therefore uh, unmovable in his being. He doesn't change, doesn't evolve. That God is static rather than ecstatic. Mm -hmm. That God is in many times we portray him as an elderly figure, predominantly male, generally, <laughs> and characterized by monotony in many cases, which basically reduces God to an idol and reduces our approach to him to idolatry. So many times if we don't have the correct conception, we may be engaging in idolatry and not worship proper, even if we are part of the bona fide lineage. So again, unconsciously, some of us may be entertaining some of these notions. And, and why? Because someone may ask why, why someone will reach such a conclusion. Why we will just run to a fixed, unmovable, changeless, predictable God instead of an ever-evolving dynamic one, which sounds more exciting. Yeah, it sounds more exciting, and but saying that is easier than embracing that. <laughs> because many times for us, Static objects, things that do not change, appear more controllable to us. And most of us are control freaks with all respect. That means to be that's what it means to be a conditioned soul. <laughs> we are not very able to let go and trust and be okay with someone else being in control. It's difficult for us to fear to, 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 to accept that. We unconsciously fear what's beyond our control the unknown, the uncertain. So that's why we try to control things. So if someone is ever evolving, it's clearly out of our control. That can be a problem. The concept of an ever evolving God challenges hmm? established notions, established certainties, and, and throw us, so to say, into a continuous journey of rediscovering God, rediscovering God, love, reality, ourselves. Everything is constantly new. So it keeps us on... In the outside of the comfort zone, basically, which has its own comfort, as we talked yesterday. But this can be disconcerting for those of us who are attached to more predictable patterns of reality. Mm -hmm. If we think that, okay, God is changing, God is evolving, God is growing, we may think, okay, that, that makes a fickle God, an unstable God an untrustworthy God. Sometimes we may translate that in that way. So understandably, so to say, uh, the idea of an unchanging God may offer us solace. Solace, you say solace? Security, no? stability. Especially for those of us who are living in disarray and turbulence, and we want something 
trustworthy and fixed and predictable and predictable. Hmm? However, as we have already seen and will continue to see, <laughs> God is ever evolving by nature. That's his mood. He's dancing. He's moving. Especially if we talk in terms of Krishna and Mahaprabhu, they are depicted as dancing in move. They are not fixed. Mm -hmm. And again, God is the root of reality. So if the root of reality is that, mm -hmm. everything else is so as well. And if the root of reality, any conception or misconception that we have about the root of reality, as I say, extends naturally to whatever is rooted in that reality. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned in radical personalism, well, changing our perception of God for good has the potential to change everything else. Not changing our perspective on God when we need to do so has not changing our perspective of God has the potential to change nothing. <laughs> and generally, we need to change our perspectives. Mm -hmm. So let me bring a few purva paksha or a few opposing arguments to this thesis to nuance my discussion and to really ground it more. So people will, some of us will say, but Maharaj, in the scriptures, in Shastra, it is clearly and repeatedly stated that God is changeless. We have many words for that. Hmm? Abhyayam, abhikriyam, and so on. Even in one of the 64 qualities of Krishna that Rupa Goswami depicts, one of them is that God is, is changeless. And I'm not here denying that. But we need to understand what's the meaning of changeless, in which sense God is changeless. Because interestingly, Rupa Goswami says Krishna is changeless in one of this, in this list of 64 qualities, but two qualities after that, he describes Krishna as Nitya Nutana, which means ever fresh. <laughs> so that's interesting. God is changeless, God is ever fresh. So we need to reconcile these two. We cannot just cherry pick one or the other. So in which sense God is changeless? God is changeless in terms of his of not being affected by the changes we see in us. We experience ourselves in this temporary body, so to say. That's how actually Rupa Goswami qualifies God's changelessness. He says, Sada Swarupa Samprapta, which means God is always situated in his eternal form. In that sense, he's changeless. Not in every other sense. In, Krishna is always Krishna, basically. Krishna always has his flute, his peacock feather, his sham-like color, and so on. His eternal Swarupam form. He's changeless in that sense. Hmm? But also, he remains in perpetual evolution. He's nityanottana, ever fresh. So in that sense, he's changeless also. We could say God is changeless because what doesn't change in, about him is the fact that he remains in perpetual evolution. That doesn't change about him. That's changeless. <laughs> Let me share a quote from Sanatan Goswami in this connection, Brihad Bhagavatamrita. He says, he, he combines these two very nicely, God's changelessness and God's ever-evolvingness. He says, although the Supreme Lord is always one and unchanging, at every moment he brings forth hundreds of newer and newer varieties of transcendental charm, both in himself and in his love. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the quote, one of them in this connection. He's one and unchanging in the sense we already explained, but at the same time, he's bringing newer and newer and newer varieties and experiences. He's ever fresh, ever evolving. Mm -hmm. And other mystical traditions also entertain this. Mystical Christianity is filled with statements in this connection. Let me just share one today. Christian theologian, uh, Mr. Eckhart, you may have heard about him, but similarly, he asserted the same idea. He said, God is the newest thing there is and is the youngest thing there is. Mm -hmm. Probably we go with the Vaishnavas, we cannot avoid thinking of, of, of definition of Krishna's Nava Yovanam, no? always young, Nitya Kishore, eternally adolescent, no? and so on, ever fresh. We are talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> and Chaitanya Charitamrita says that in a very beautiful way. You know? Krishna, Krishna is the all attractive you know, to begin with. The name is the all attractive. He who becomes attractive at every moment. So Chaitanya Charitamrita says Krishna's beauty increases at every moment. Again, ever evolving. With every passing second, Krishna is more Krishna because Krishna is the all attractive. So the all attractive becomes more attractive. Krishna Krishnaises himself at every moment. His body becomes more beautiful. And of course, Krishna is not different from his body. So that speaks about his whole identity evolving. And in response, Chaitanya Charitamrita says the gopis reciprocate to that increased beauty by increasing their love. The more beautiful Krishna becomes, the more the, lo the love of his devotees increase. And the more that love is offered to him, that makes him more beautiful. <laughs> so the love of the devotees make Krishna more beautiful and the increased beauty of Krishna makes their devotees more loving. So the two of them are constantly evolving. Krishna's beauty, the devotees' love, and, and Chaitanya Charitamrita concludes, the two of them are constantly increasing the sacred competition, engaging in a sacred battle with, where neither of them accept defeat. <laughs> They are constantly evolving and growing and growing and trying to keep the pace of each other. So that's the nature of, of reality. That's the nature of love. Even if you want to define God in more classical Upanishadic terms, some may say, okay, I'm not a Gaudiya Vaishnav, so I don't subscribe to all this Krishna, Leela, Gopis stuff, so to say. I'm more go, go for Upanishads and Brahman. The description of the absolute. Okay, let's go there and let's begin there. <laughs> we can begin and end there and stay there forever. Brahman, the very word Brahma, which not only is limited to the impersonal aspect of God, but to the it's a way of referring to the absolute. Krishna being Para Brahman, Purna Brahman. Brahman, the definition of Brahman, if you go to the Dhatu, to the Sanskrit root of the term Brim, refers to expansion. So Brahman means that which is great and expansive and also makes others great and expansive. <laughs> so the very definition of the main word in this Upanishad about the Absolute, about God, implies constant evolution. Brahman, that which is in expansion, it's growing, always more beautiful, always more loving. We will put it like that as Kodhya Vaishnavas. And someone may argue at this point, one last Purva Paksha, one last opposing uh, argument, is but God is perfect. So if God is perfect, how can you say that He is changing or evolving, which may presuppose that He was not perfect and He is, has to become perfect? So the problem with this is how we uh, interpret the word perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes, Krishna is perfect, of course, but He can become more and more perfect on the basis of Him being perfect. The thing is, when we hear perfect, perfection is not a fixed maximum. I'll repeat it again for better impact. Perfection is not a fixed maximum. No, this is perfection. You cannot, not, once you reach this perfection, it cannot get more than, it's not a numerical thing, right? And that's why Rupa Goswami will describe Krishna in, Rupa, in Bhaktara Samrita Sindhu. Krishna in Dwarka is Purna or complete or perfect. Krishna in Mathura is Purnatara. He's more perfect. And Krishna in Vrindavan is Purnatama, the most perfect. So still all of them are perfect. All of them include the word Purna, but there are layers and degrees of perfection. Because again, due to the nature of love and due to the nature of God himself, he can always become more perfect. Like sometimes it is said, the only limitation that God has is that he has no limitation. So similarly, we could say this, the only quote-unquote imperfection that God has is that he's never quote-unquote perfect enough because he can always become more perfect due to the nature of love. Again, words are, in, are insufficient. Our head and thoughts are insufficient. By this point, you may be having smoke coming out of your ears, collapsing all our functions. <laughs> facing this ever-evolvingness of reality. So for a moment, take a deep breath and relax. <laughs> we are reaching 
it's the end of our presentation, but still we want to share some words in connection to the soul as ever evolving us. What about us? And then material energy. So bear with me a few more minutes, please. So we already talked how love is ever evolving and how God affected by that love and be made of that love, if you will, is also ever evolving. So now we'll talk about the soul as ever evolving, how the potential of the jiva, of the atma, of the soul is ever evolving as well, in connection with love, in connection with an ever evolving God. So we are tatasta. Sometimes that's defined as such. The soul is called tatasta shakti, which somehow can be translated as we are units of potential. Tatasta defined, speaks about according to the environment we associate with will be influenced in one direction or another. So that speaks about potential and possibilities. So we are units of potential. Hmm? We are our potential. That's another way of putting it. We are not different from our potential. <clears throat> we are not different from all that we can be. <clears throat> so we should do well in identifying with that. We are Shakti, <clears throat> Jiva Shakti or Tatasta Shakti. We are potency. We are Shakti. And as I already mentioned, <clears throat> sorry, potency presupposes potential. There's no potency without potential. So potency implies potential and potential in terms implies a realm of infinite possibilities, ever evolving possibilities, infinite possibilities, especially under the shelter of an ever evolving God and ever evolving love. We have unlimited potential, no? unlimited becoming. No? We are something, but we can become something in potential. We are not only human beings, as I like to put it, but we are also human becomings. <laughs> so it's good that we learn to identify ourselves as that. The soul is mm, in, in a, it's, it's a unit of perpetual becoming. Mm. Again, let's bring some Purva Paksha to make my presentation as balanced as we can. Some opposing arguments. Someone may say, but the Bhagavad Gita, Maharaj, chapter 2, verse 20, says that the soul is changeless. So how can you say it's ever evolving? Gita 2.20 says, the soul has not come into being, does not come into being, and will not come into being. So what's all this talk about becoming and so on? And similarly, chapter 16 from verse 2 says, of the eternal, there is no change. And we know that the soul is eternal, so we will conclude it's changeless. But rather than negating the potential for perpetual evolution, these verses above are emphasizing again that the, the, the soul is never born and will never perish. If you understand these statements in context, there's what, what's being said in that section is the soul is not born, the soul is not dying. In that sense, it's not coming into being. It's not stops coming into being. No, it's, it's not born and will never perish. The soul is eternal. In that sense, the soul is changeless. In the sense that the soul never stops being eternal. But that changelessness doesn't cancel the potential for perpetual evolution. And that's confirmed, for example, by Sri Jiva Goswami in his Paramatma Sandarbha. There, in, there he, he presents a list of 21 qualities, intrinsic qualities of the soul. And, and he mentions one of them is the soul is free from modifications. No, it's changeless. Right? Like Rupa Goswami's list with Krishna. Krishna is changeless and then he says he's ever new. Here in this list, Jiva Goswami says the soul is free from modifications, so it's changeless. But then very quickly in that same list, Sila Jiva Swami says, the soul is imbued with intrinsic potentialities. Mm -hmm. So again, intrinsic potentialities imply the soul has the potential to evolve. Not, not to become something else apart from the soul, but the soul is a unit of potential. Mm -hmm. So if we consider the potential of the soul in terms of bhakti, in terms of all that we can be in love, we'll be amazed. We'll be astonished 
by who we are. That was the whole point of my presentation some days ago on self-love in bhakti. You need to love yourself for who you are as a soul, including your beautiful potential. And Krishna himself confirms that. If you go to the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, similar section, verse 29, there Krishna describes the soul in overwhelmingly positive terms. He will use the term ascharya, which is translated as amazing. He uses that three times. He basically says to each of you, you are amazing, you are amazing, you are amazing, especially considering what's your brightest potential in bhakti. Wow, amazing. Ascharya means wonder, shocking, miracle, astonishing, extraordinary, all that the soul is as a unit of potential. Mm -hmm. So it's a very important point to see ourselves not only for who we are, but for all that we can be in potential. But also let me share two warnings in this connection. Because when we speak too much about potential, yes, we have limitless, unlimited bright potential. <laughs> like Srila Selmash will say, your future is brilliant. But also, we have unlimited dark potential you know, if we don't express our potential in the right direction. So we have to be very careful, sobered by that potential to go in the darkest direction. We have ever-evolving potential, but also we have ever-devolving potential. And we can see the, the, the horrors, atrocities made by human beings are the worst we can imagine on any other species. That speaks about that. We have so much potential. So unless we have some well-developed insight into our capacity for evil, so to say, for degradation and dark potential, until we reach that insight, we have no actual insight into our capacity for good, so to say. Our brightest potential how has to be sobered by our darkest potential. Mm -hmm. So we manage that energy, that potential in a careful, respectful way. So that's one warning when we speak about our potential. And one last warning before concluding this section is, while we focus our potential and that can be so enriching, but we have to be careful not to do so uh, at the cost of the present moment. Uh, we, we, we have to be careful not to become obsessed with the future, like just what I will become, what I have to become, and dismiss the present moment because the present moment is the actual portal to any form of potential. I have a future, a, br a brilliant future, a bright potential, but I can only attain that from the here and now. So when we talk about becoming and potential, it's not... So we live in the future, but we live in the present, and from that present, we do what's necessary to attain our brightest future and potential. Mm -hmm. So present moment. What's happening in the present moment? Just to conclude this section, that's an important point. Let's go back to the here and now as bhaktas. What's happening to us, as I like to say, bhakti has come to your life. The goal of life is love, bhakti, and bhakti came to your life. The goal of life came to your life. You attain the goal of life, in one sense. Bhakti came. In that sense, you are already saved. We are already saved. We, we can state that with confidence and humble trust. We are already saved. We are already doing what we want to do for eternity. Bhakti. Hmm? We are not striving for to att attain an otherworldly goal. Instead, it's more beneficial to, to recognize the goal has manifested in my life. And I can practice that hmm? happily. The goal came to me, bhakti came to me. And Krishna says, if you practice bhakti sincerely, nothing can will make you perish, you will not lose anything. So many quotes. <clears throat> but we are already saved by the grace of bhakti, by the arrangement. And so if I'm already saved, the only question that remains is what to do with my salvation. <clears throat> because again, we have an ever-evolving prospect as jivas of giving back the embrace. That's the answer. What to do with my salvation? Well, I'm saved. What to do now with my life? My re redeemed existence? Well, I have an ever-evolving prospect. So I will use that, so to say, to give back the embrace that I receive in loving service for eternity. I will engage in devotional service, as, as I like to call it. <laughs> if we have this deeply evolutionary vision, we will engage in evotional service. A devotional service tinged with this ever-evolvingness. I will live our life 
as a celebration. Kirtan means celebration. Susukam Kartum, says Krishna in the Gita. You will practice bhakti with lots of joy and happiness, realizing the nature, the ever evolving nature of that. So, anyhow, a few words on this. Again, maybe I'm saying too much in, in short time, so sorry if it's too packed. The, this needs some packing, and that will be done next month in, in our four classes. But a few words on our ever evolving potential as souls in connection to an ever evolving love and God. So let's conclude with the last section, <clears throat> a few more minutes, which is let's talk about matter, material energy as ever evolving. If God, love, and us are ever evolving, Shakti Man and all on these two other Shaktis, what about these other Shakti, sometimes called Maya Shakti, material energy? Can it be ever evolving in its own way? We will say yes. Mm -hmm. We have been talking about deep evolution. So if there's deep evolution, there must be deep matter as well. You know, let's inhabit, visit the depths of matter, matter beyond what it seems to be on the outside. Because if ever evolving love again affects God Himself, we are in turn affected by God and love being ever evolving. So the question is, how does matter respond to this pattern? How does matter becomes affected by this ever evolvingness of everything? Mm -hmm. On some level, I touch upon this in the last chapter of my book on radical personalism. Last chapter, remember, called "Unearthing Heaven." Mm -hmm and how to see matter with new lenses, how to properly honor it, worship it, relate to it in a sacred way. So the spirit of this section will be similar. <clears throat> how to see the world of matter in connection with God, ever-evolving love, and so on. Well, Vedanta Sutra says, Loka Bhattu Lila Kaivalyam. The love life of God explodes into not only into the world, but as the world. This, this material creation, the Shristi Lila, is a byproduct of loves, of God's love, God's love life in transcendence. That's what Vedanta Sutra and the commentaries in this section say, very interestingly. So there's a way to see this world as a result of that ever evolvingness in God's own heart. So as, as God's heart evolves, we, will, we could say matter evolves to accommodate it accommodate God's heart. It's all trying to keep the pace. Mm -hmm. Of course, sometimes we <clears throat> we use these expressions of inert matter, or even worse, sometimes dead matter. But how much matter is inert and dead? Mm -hmm. material, material energy remains in constant movement and evolution. So how, how in dead and inert can matter be? Mm -hmm. Again, matter is energy, shakti. So energy, something which is an energy is synonymous with something alive. It makes no sense to say dead energy, inert energy. Energy is energetic as life of its own. It's a potency. It's a potency indicates potential. Energy points to something energetic, dynamic, therefore in perpetual unfolding, in movement, in evolution. Whether we accept biological evolution or not of some of the varieties of Darwinistic perspectives, which is a bigger conversation that I may not, I not, I don't have time to do it here, but I will address in my book and hopefully in the series next month. But whether if someone even says, I don't believe in Darwinistic perspective for whatever reason, but this we have to accept, no? that matter is not as inert as we may have thought, right? It's living reality. It is alive in its own way. Mm -hmm. We could say there are different ways of being alive. Mm -hmm. And the so-called inertness of matter actually indicates another way of being alive. Mm -hmm. For example, Brahma Samhita, verse 35, of course, of the fifth chapter, describes that God is fully present in every atom. So every pore of creation, let's put it poetically, is oozing with the presence of the most living person. The most living person is in every atom of matter. Is, is that not alive enough? How can you say matter is dead and inert in every sense while the most alive person is inhabiting each of its pores and atoms? Mm -hmm. And nowadays, not only Brahma Samhita is confirming this, but modern science 
like quantum physics confirms similar facts. No? Quantum physics says that what we call matter and, and, and what we imagine as matter, again, being like a solid, fixed substance, dead and inert, what we call matter actually is a unified field, a unified field of dynamic vibrations. Like, put it in another way, our universe has an intrinsic musical quality to it. No wonder our God is a flute player, <laughs> he's a musician, he's a dancer, not of art, the best dancer. So it's no wonder that whatever is happening in that realm, in that origin source reality, naturally extends its DNA, its blueprint to, to the world of matter. So that's, again, scientifically proved, if you will. Matter is on the move. It's dynamic. It's vibrating. We can call it, it's, it's sounding, it's singing, it's music. It's a whole symphony, universal symphony. That's how our, our practice and sound is about sound, aligning properly with sound, because everything is emanating some form of musicality. Mm -hmm. So again, instead of seeing matter as a lifeless object, matter is to be recognized, recognized huh, as a living reality filled with energy, filled with a life of its own, filled with God's presence in every pore. So in that way, we must conclude <clears throat> there's no dead matter. And in that sense, there's nothing actually is dead in the material world. <laughs> matter cannot ultimately die in terms of stop existing or disappearing. Matter can only change form. And it's in that way, matter is eternal. It continues to exist in one form or another. And so whether we talk about physical matter or psychic matter, uh, in both cases, material energy remains eternal, remains infinite, if you want to put it like that. Not only because of the countless amount of matter that exists in unlimited universes, but because of this relentless expansion and evolution and movement that we are defining. Hmm? Matter is yeah, infinite. You can refer to something infinite, at least in the scriptures, something infinite is indicated by the terms anadi and ananta. Hmm? Anadi means without beginning, ananta means without end. So something which has no beginning and end is labeled infinite. And in fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15, verse 3, where this banyan tree of material existence is described, the world of matter... Hmm? symbolically depicted in this tree is described exactly with those two terms anadi ananta it has no beginning it has no end therefore matter is infinite mm -hmm. eternal infinite so so far we have established how matter is alive in its own way it's infinite and it's eternal in its own way all in its own way but it's there mm -hmm. so again if this is the case matter must also remain in a state of permanent expansion, indefinitely. Uh, because that's the quality of something that is eternal, infinite, uh, and alive. <laughs> we, as you have already explained. It's also ever-evolving. Whatever is alive, eternal and infinite, it must be ever-evolving. So if matter is alive, infinite, and eternal, matter is also, in its own way, ever-evolving. Mm -hmm. Again, there is a place for explaining all this in the context of biological evolution. And there is a place for confront, having our faith confronted with scientific facts. I personally believe in, in the, 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 the not only the possibility, but the necessity of this type of dialogue and, and of understanding scriptural statements by scientific findings and other disciplines. Uh, there are ways in which certain statements from the Bhagavatam can be really read in evolutionary terms. Again, I have no time now to delve into that, but we will do that when we do the, the separate classes for each one of these four topics. But again, I will say, even if you don't believe in that, even if you are utterly denial, in denial of any form of Darwinistic perspectives and biological evolution, still the other points that I have just shared prevail. Matter is in its own way, infinite, eternal, and alive. We have quoted Shastra for that. <laughs> and therefore, if those three are there, matter must be also ever evolving. Mm -hmm. 
So in essence, to conclude this particular point, material energy is not inert, it's not inanimate, it's not temporary in every sense, it's not stagnant, but it's alive, infinite, eternal, and ever-evolving. Why? Because God himself, again, is possessed of each of these attributes and thus everything else does by extension in their own unique way. So I think these are important paradigm shifts that we need to embrace. Just to conclude the whole presentation, we need to embrace these paradigm shifts. My intention is this uh, words may provide some new perspective on how we are relating to God, to love, to ourselves, to the world of matter. We cannot relate to anything else. Those are all the things that we can relate with. <laughs> so if we develop an ever-evolving perspective in relationship, in relationship with all of them, I, I'm totally sure that our life will be a constant epiphany and a source of wonder and inspiration and aliveness and so on. While we can have the wrong perspective and relate to all of them, love, God, us, matter, in limited ways, predictable, bore, boring ways, <laughs> Uh, stagnating ways, uh, and so on and so forth, and live our lives in very different ways. And so for me, this is a very crucial point to understand, a very important shift to make, so we can experience reality for what it is in, in all of its forms, whether we are talking about the love, God, ourselves, the soul, and matter, to experience reality for what it is, which is an ever-evolving uh, phenomenon, an ever-evolving gift, if you will. So anyhow, a few words, not, not only a few words, but considerable some words in this connection. <clears throat> so thank you so much for your time. Now I'm almost leaving. Uh, we have to travel. We have a road trip from here to North Carolina. So I don't have actually that much time to entertain questions, but maybe I can entertain a few, one or two, and maybe reply to them briefly if they are. Uh, if not, of course, we can conclude here, but just leave in that space. I know I've said a lot, and probably you're all trying to process and survive all the amount of <laughs> things that I shared. But if there is anything you may like to, to ask about or to share, we have a few minutes for that, no problem. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for, for the presentation. I have one question, Maras. Yes, tell me. Uh, as you mentioned, um, overall presentation was regarding how Krishna is ever evolving, <clears throat> love is ever ever evolving, and we as a jiva also have the potential to you know, <clears throat> ever evolve in relation mm -hmm. to love and God. So. If Krishna and nature of love and Krishna is ever evolving, and we have the potential to, you know, ever evolve in relation to Krishna, then how uh, how do we understand that we are, you know, from our current situation doing enough to keep up the pace, you know, with the ever evolving mm -hmm. nature of God and love. Yeah. How do we know that we are doing enough or, you know, striving enough to keep up with that principle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's an important question in practice because we can really get neurotic about that. No? Like you can always do more, it's ever evolving and you can just at one point be paralyzed because there's so much more to do that you may even be discouraged about doing anything. <laughs> but of course, that's not the idea of this presentation. The idea is to, as Krishna says, to keep it balanced. So <clears throat> even though we have an endless, ever-evolving prospect, of course, we can never attain that in one single moment, nor ever, <laughs> because it's always expanding. So for me, the, the, the charm and the importance of understanding things that ever-evolving is also this. It's not so much like, okay, I'm here and I have to attain, attain that particular more situation or goal, and once I attain that, it's over. I can relax. It's over. But I have not there yet. So I have to continue doing it. I'm not there yet. And I'm not there yet. And that creates a negative orientation. Instead of thinking, 
in one sense, the goal already came, as I said, bhakti came. In one sense, I attained the goal, the goal attained me. Uh, and since it's ever evolving, I can always attain that more and more deeply on a daily basis forever. So that keeps balance. And we have to be, I will say, we have to be honest and sincere with ourselves, be introspective in terms of, okay, I am giving myself today as much as I can today. Tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow I will be able to give myself a little bit more and so on and so forth. But today, I'm, I can give myself a little bit more and I'm not doing that for, and if that's going on, what's the reason for that? Trying to have a conversation, so to say, with yourself <laughs> and find that way of giving what you can give today, knowing that tomorrow there will be another chance for more of that. No, it's not all will be given today. Tomorrow will another chance and another possibility and so on and so forth forever. So I will say that that's a way to keep it balanced, to have some healthy conversation with ourselves, self-compassionate, but also challenging ourselves in a in a healthy way, you know, keeping the balance. You know? Keep, keep all everything you do, do it balanced in a balanced way. You may need to produce, you may need to re restore and recreate yourself. And all those things have to be done in a way that if you are sincere, you know I'm not being complacent, I'm not being cheating my I'm not cheating myself, I'm challenging myself enough, but not so much to become dysfunctional. So it's a daily vigilance. That's that's part of our sadhana, to remain in daily vigilance and openness. So I hope that helps, Rajendra. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Maras. Thank you. Bhakti Rasa raising her hand and probably will conclude there. So if there are more questions, we can continue talking next month with our more extended presentation. Yes. This will just be quick. Uh, it's in response <clears throat> actually with what Rajendra was speaking. As you were speaking, I was thinking also about, you've been talking about presence. So Krishna kind of shows us how to balance these two things. He doesn't live in the future, although he's absolute becoming, he's always becoming, but he doesn't jump ahead. He's fully present and his full presence is what creates the, the next evolutionary step. So the same thing with us, even though we have a potential, our potential will unfold the more we are, are present in, in, in the present, then that's what the future unfolding builds upon is the present moment. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that contribution. Okay. Sorry if there are more questions, but again, we have a long drive back home here. So we'll conclude here. Thank you so much for your presence, for your questions, for your willingness to hear and, and be part of this Tadatmya Sangha. And next month, as I mentioned, we will try to uh, make a more extended presentation in four classes. We'll be announcing that in, in a few weeks. And for those who would like to connect with our next Tadatmya lecture, that will be in two weeks exactly. Uh, I think it's 20, what, 26th of May. And will be Kalakanti Dasi from Sadhananda Swami's uh, tribe. <laughs> and her presentation will be about aligning your in align your inner compass with bhakti, clear concepts and single pointed focus. So that will be the, the title and subtitle of her presentation. So thank you so much to all of you. Sri Sachinandan Gaur Hari Ki Jai, Sri Harinam Prabhu Ki Jai, Sri Sri Gornitananda Gaur Gadadar Ju Ki Jai, Sri Sri Radha Madan Mohan Radha Govinda Dev Radha Gopinath Ju Ki Jai, Gaur Bhaktavrinda Ki Jai, Gaur Primananda Hari Bo, Banchakal Pataru Gistak Dukasindu Pye Vacha, Patita Anam Pavane Fiyo Bhaisna